Thanks, Brandon. Uh, hi, I'm Stephen. Um, I'm going to talk about something that we end up using a lot. Um, in, in functional programming, we usually prefer immutability. That's kind of like made its way out into Swift in general. Always prefer like lead over var. Um, you know, the exception is like structs are pretty good with having local mutable state. But even then, like depending on how big your local state gets, you may lose track of all the different like representations a value might have. Um, I'm going to start with something very basic. Um, you know, you might have a just count value, and let's start with zero. And to, to increment it, you know, as a var, we could just do count plus equals one. But, you know, depending on how long this function or scope is, you might end up with, you know, a result that you're not expecting. Uh, the way to usually solve that is, you know, promote to a let, realize that we now need to have another assignment in this case, so we can call it new count. And, uh, well, we want it to be equal to count plus one. And we can, you know, make things a little more functional by defining a function. Uh, we're finding that we increment things a lot, so let's just do an increment function. It'll take an x, which is an int, produce another int. The way to implement this, we already know. It's going to be x plus 1. And now we can just say new count should be equal to the incremented version of count. So we're very used to like trying to create these pipelines for our data as it changes over time. Um, but you know, right now it's just input and output. And we're not dealing with more complex data structures. So like what happens if we do something as simple as try to swap this out for like a tuple? So let's have like a score tuple. And we have like the current score and maybe the user's like name. And now if we wanted to somehow increment this score, like really, you know, we're not going to make it a var. We don't want to do assignment on like dot zero. Uh, but we can say let new score is equal to incrementing our scores first part. And then we just pass the other part through. And this may seem like, you know, let's just do this in place because it's fine. But it obviously is not the most readable thing in the world. Uh, if you're dealing with a larger tuple or a larger structure, like it starts breaking down pretty quick. Um, so how do we like make this work and, and make it cleaner? Well, you know, we could just do like anchor first, like that will work. We now have our pair where we have, you know, an int and a string. It returns another int string. And, you know, we get some composition, right? We get to return our anchored pair, some code reuse. But, you know, that's not super useful. Like, we're having to create a new function per, like, small part of the data structure changing. Um, so it turns out, like, we can use some higher order functions to make it so we could have just reused anchor from the get-go. So let's define a function called first. And we're going to be dealing with a tuple. So let's just have the left hand and right hand kind of parts of it. And the first thing we want to do, usually with uh, function composition, is providing the function. So let's have a function. We're going to call it f. And it's just going to go from a to b, or actually a to a in this case. Um, and that is going to return another function that takes in the whole tuple. So in this case, an a and a b. And it's finally going to return like an updated a to b. So whenever we return a function from a function, we've got to open it up. So let's do that. Uh, we have our pair now um, from right here. And now it's going to look a lot like anchor first. We just need to return f applied to the first part of the pair and then the right-hand side. Um, oh, gets me every time. 
So now that we have this kind of first function, uh, we can actually have something a lot more reusable. Um, instead of new score just being like anchor first, where we take our score, like that does look nice. Um, and you might even think that the next version is going to be worse, because we end up calling first and then passing anchor before the score. Same result, more parentheses. Um, this, is, this is the path a lot of us go down, and, and it scares a lot of folks from functional programming in Swift. Uh, because in order to get past this, um, we end up going in, into a land where we try to erase parentheses. Uh, and there's some good reason for this. Like, let's, let's consider how we would compose this right now. What if we wanted to increment it twice? Well, we would have to call first again with anchor and then pass the result of that. And so now like this becomes almost just unreadable. Um, and this is like a very simple example too. So I'm going to do what I love doing, which is I'm going to introduce an operator. Uh, it's going to be just function application. And uh, we're going to do uh, associativity to the left, just so we can keep applying as we go. I'm going to use the infix operator of pipe forward, which is pretty common in different languages. Um, and defining it, you know, we just want to have an A and a B, where our, you know, left hand side is going to be our A. The, the right-hand side is going to be our function that just transforms A to B. So the one place where we don't need to escape, uh, we finally return a B. And this is just F applied to X. And the nice thing about this is now we can kind of like make this a bit nicer. We can just take our score. Uh, we can pipe it into first to increment it. It's kind of almost looking object-oriented at this point, like where the pipe forward is the dot. Uh, but we also get this nice chaining method. Uh, we can just keep incrementing it along. And we are able to go up to 44 now. Um, something that's neat about this is we're dealing with this kind of you know, amorphous tuple structure. So it's, it's not as like, constrained as like, uh, a struct. So we, we could actually add a third parameter here and even make things a, a bit nicer. Like we could say after we increment, maybe we somehow want to convert to a string to print on the screen somewhere. And we, we get like all this kind of just nice declarative syntax just to use whenever. Um, and you know, we would have to kind of define one more function to get a ton of reusability. I'm just going to quickly copy and paste because most of the logic is the same. But now we're going to do B to C, and our A to B is going to go for, from like to A to C. And so we just need to make sure we apply F to the second part. And now I could even continue to byte forward and say, well, I also want to render this as uppercase. So we should get kind of a screaming blob out there, which is pretty great. Um, so what happens when you go deeper? Like this, this is actually pretty nice syntax if you're dealing with a lot of tuples. Uh, you only had to really define, well, you had an operator, so embrace the operator. And then you, know, you can manipulate these tuples at will. But what if you had like, uh, you know, a nested tuple? Well, we have a lot of machinery already, but it's, again, going to look kind of gross. Uh, we can take the first and say we want to like, get that middle element. Uh, we can open it up, take that tuple, and then pipe that into first again. <laughs> and then, uh, well, we can just, well, let's just replace it wholesale with 500. And there we go. It, it, if we change this to second, it'll do the middle element. Um, so this seems a little tedious. It may not be apparent 
like immediately the way that we can simplify it. Um, but I'm taking my other favorite tool in the functional tool chain, which is uh, another operator. Uh, and this is just function composition. Um, so in this case, we're going to give it associativity uh, to the right. And we are going to make sure that it has a higher precedence than our apply. Um, I'm going to use the infix operator uh, triple arrow left. Uh, and that's because usually when we do function composition, we are kind of like composing it from right to left. And you'll see that with the definition. So in this case, we're going to have three generic parameters. And I'm going to start with g, which is going to be a function. And it is going to be escaping uh, from b to c. And then our f is going to be escaping a to b. And we're going to glue them together to finally produce a function that goes from a to c. And we'll open up that function. We have our, I'm going to use x because we love calling our a's x's. And well, we see x is an a, which means we can pass it to f. Then we can pass it to g. And that's kind of all there is to it. What's nice is this example here becomes a lot simpler. You can basically get rid of the point and just compose it together. And this is kind of like object-oriented programming again, except the dot also is triple arrow backwards. Um, but you see it's able to replace it. You can, again, chain these. You can get the first of the first. And you could just, I don't know, change the, the actual types along the way. And yeah, I don't know. I, th I think it's pretty cool that we have no mutable state here. Like you could quickly manipulate data along the way and never have to, to worry about the scope and whether or not something might change in an unexpected way. Um, so let's think of like more complicated structures like structs. So say we no longer just want to have the name of our user. We actually want to contain it within a struct. Uh, maybe we're tracking some things like their favorite food. We'll actually create a food struct as well. And let's just create a sample user here. I'm going to just do my name. Uh, and I think burger. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Getting ahead of myself. So I could create like a, a function per thing here, like the way that we did first and second. Um, but that wouldn't scale super well. Like if I just had a username function, which takes a function that goes from the first string to the second, and then took in a user and then a user. Like that doesn't scale super well. Um, luckily in Swift 4 and I guess 3.2, we can solve this problem pretty like elegantly and in one place just using key paths. Um, so the way that we would do that is let's just define a function called prop. And we're going to be dealing with key paths. So they usually refer to this as like you have your root type and you have your value. And instead of taking a function, we're going to actually take a key path to describe basically the, the getters and setters underneath. And so we want to use writable key paths uh, because we are going to be mutating the value. Um, and it's just going to be from root to value. Uh, to maintain the shape of kind of all these functions, what we really want to return first is an escaping function. 
uh, that goes from value to value. And then this is going to return a function that first takes a root and then finally produces another root. So how do we do this? We're, we've got a lot of errors going on here, so kind of let's break it down. We first need to return a function, from, a function that takes a function from value to value. We can just call this like update. And then we have another nested, nested function which takes our root that we want to change. And because it's just a, a parameter, it's immutable. So here we're going to do a little mutation. I'm kind of cheating, but it's going to be contained. Um, so we're going to assign a copy uh, the root. And then we're just going to open up that key path on our copy. And we are going to apply the update function to the current value. So we can just do that on the copy as well. And we finally want to return the updated copy. All right, Xcode's happy. So what would this look like? Well, we have the user. And we can kind of pipe it in to our prop function. And we should be able to just change the name. Uh, in this case, we can update it using you know, kind of shouty case. You can see that it's run that, but let's just dump the value uh, below just to make sure. And we see that. Uh, but what's cool is like we can keep chaining these. Um, we can do another prop uh, to the favorite food dot name and maybe I should eat more salads so that just replaces it all at once uh, no like local mutation again um, what's cool is these things actually compose so what if we get back to our, our score and we have 50 in user well these Mutations can still happen. We just want to make sure that we're referring to the second part of the tuple. And we can also uh, reach into the first. And let's increment the score. That's pretty cool. Like, this is deeply nested changes that just kind of work, stuff we're used to. But we're able to do things in a very kind of like functional, declarative way. Uh, we're not just creating copies everywhere and mutating them and, and hoping that we don't mutate them later. Um, so that's kind of like the, one of the main data structures. But we, we have like a couple more that we should probably couple, uh, cover. Uh, one of them is, it was mentioned before, I'm going to do a simplified version of it. It's the result type. And it just has two cases. We either have a value of A or we have an error. And I'm just going to do string to make it a bit easier. Um, so Swift doesn't have any mechanism right now to kind of do key path stuff for uh, enums. So there is a little boilerplate here. Uh, the nice thing is like enums kind of don't change the structure of the individual cases very often. So the boilerplate is more manageable. Uh, if we changed our user struct right now, like, and we did you know, old-fashioned functions, we would have to account for all the, the additional properties. So let's just do a value function. And it's going to look a lot like the rest. So we have an escaping. In this case, let's do A to A and get our generic parameter in. It's going to take a result of A and return another result of A. And because it is generic, like, you know, why don't we allow for transformation of the underlying type as well? So in this case, we are going to return our results. And we can just do kind of a switch on the result for case analysis. We can do case let value value. And in this case, we just want to rewrap the value by applying the function to our value. And then in the case of an error, 
because we changed it to a B, we want to also rewrap it. All right, still working. I'm going to disable this. So now if we had like a result of hello, we should be able to kind of pipe that into our value function and, you know, make it excited. And we, we do. Um, and, you know, if this were an error instead, and we'll just keep it hello, it's a friendly error. Uh, oh, but the result needs to re reflect what we think the value is. So in this case, we have the, the error is hello, but it hasn't changed. So we could actually kind of have some Boolean logic in here, depending on whether there's a value or error. And in the case of an error, you know, we can transform the string to a string, and the result stays the same. And we just apply f to the error. And now we can just swap this setter out, and, you know, kind of works as, as you would expect. And again, like, you can compose these. It all just kind of works out, because it's, it's all just function composition in the end. So you would just want to compose the second to error, compose the first to increment. And you could build like, like wildly complex data structures here with like API types, et cetera, and it should all still work. I'm just going to cover one more type, um, and that is it's a structure that contain like zero or more values. Um, in this case, let's just do an array. And we need to create another one of these transformation functions. Uh, I'm not sure what to call this right now, so it's going to be like foo. Uh, it has an A and a B. And we have this function that is escaping that goes from A to B. And I'll take an array of A's and produce an array of B's. And this is actually looking kind of familiar. Does anyone think of a function that kind of does this? Matt? It's map. So we can just take our array and map our function to it. And let's just call it map. The difference is because we're defining this as a free function, we can start using it like within these chains. So now we can take our array of numbers and we can pipe it through map of anchor and it's gonna increment all the numbers. Uh, what if we go a little bit deeper than that? Like, what if these are an array of optional numbers? Well, optional also has map on it. So we just define this once against optional. And I think we only need to change the signature. And the only difference now is, well, we're two layers deep. So we need to compose our map two layers deep. And now we get kind of incremented optionals throughout. Um, so these are like three kind of wildly different data structures. We have been able to compose them all together with just functions kind of chaining all the way down. Um, we could, let's just for fun, try to do something using all of them. Um, let's do a results where the value is, um, say, a tuple of 42, our user. Um, actually, let's do an array with a optional user in there. All right, so if anyone's tried to change the value of an enum, they know it's kind of a, a pain. But like now we can actually kind of like jump in there, compose the value with the, you know, first part of the tuple. And uh, we can just say that we want to increment it. 
then we can actually go into the values second part. Um, and now we know we're in an array of users, and we can just map that user. Uh, it's optional user, so we can map it again. And now we can grab a prop of the user's favorite food and its name. Uh, and finally, just it's the, the easiest thing at hand. And just in case this is too much for the sidebar. This stuff really puts the playgrounds at, at its limit. Uh, Oh, am I? I might be confused with. I thought I said the. We've been composing these quite a bit, so it is associativity, right? Oh. How is that building? Oh. Was that the first time I composed more than one by your deed? Wow. OK. <laughs> so. I tried to avoid scary words for the talk, um, but you, you learned a lot of like <laughs> optics. So the, the tuple and struct stuff, they're lenses. Um, the enum kind of transformations are, are generally known as prisms. And at the very end, we were dealing with traversals. Uh, this machinery with just pure functions uh, kind of limits us to just setters in Swift. Um, but if you've heard of like the meme around profunctor optics, uh, this is a lot of what goes like into it. They just use like a richer set of like profunctor types that we can't really represent in the language at this time. But it's still fun that we can get like this much with not you know a ton of code, um, and we can create these like rich pipelines for for our data. And we can think about composing functions in ways where it's not just about you know input to output, but even by going like one layer deep, where you describe like the whole and the part. Uh, you get a lot of interesting kinds of like compositions, and I don't have slides, so I'm just gonna say thanks. <laughs>I uh, kind of fragilely. Uh, you sometimes will have to break these up into you know several steps. Um, the benefit of having it being like this is that you know you don't have to have the object and keep piping it forward. These are all functions themselves that can compose, so you can extract them to helpers without a ton of effort. you you could uh you'd probably be dealing with a lot of like overloads you might want to turn to code gen if you're dealing with tuples that size i i find that i rarely exceed like a tuple of 3 things so that would be like 5 functions total to write so i might just do that instead of code gen but if you go higher than that yeah that's an option I, I'm a hopeful. I, I filed a bunch of like bugs on, on bugs.swift. Uh, I want enum key paths and tuple key paths, and then you wouldn't have to worry about half of this code.
Yeah. I, so maybe this will resonate with some folks who use lenses, but I find my, myself using them a lot more for setting than getting, because usually when you're getting something, just in my use, like I'm sure people smarter than me have figured out how to use getters like in a really cool ways. Um, I'm always using lenses for setting, but I'm never using them for getting. Like I have the object at hand usual, usually, and just like dot chain to get to the value. But for for enums, maybe I should explore that more. Yeah, so at the bottom here, we're doing it for like mapping on the entire array. But there's also, uh, like, you can do indexed uh, lenses, which means, like, with a, with a new syntax, you would be able to do something like um, you could pluck out the first, I think the syntax is with a dot, though. So you could pluck out the first and increment it. And stuff like that. And you could do the same with like a dictionary. You pluck out a certain key um, or all of the values as well. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Anyth anyone else? No. Great. So just, just a comment. I think that was one of the best live coding I've ever seen in the talk. Just, you only get one error. So. <laughs> yeah, that's surprising to me. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone.